the internet was built without an ownership layer. It was built just purely as an information sharing layer, but you didn't have the value transport to go with the information sharing. Blockchain is nothing more than the information layer plus the value transport layer. And so that paradigm allows us to move away from the information to advertise, which is the current model we have on the internet, to information and value embedded into every piece of digital good that we have. And so that is the core, is to have a certain amount of token engineering, a certain amount of value engineering, and the incentive alignment uh, while ga having game theoretic models to um, stop scammers and frauds and people who are trying to cheat and stuff like that. So all that together uh, allows for adoption in the system because if the incentives are aligned, of course you're going to want to do this. Hi and welcome to the first episode of Information and Value. This is a video and audio podcast where we are inviting the most exciting people from the internet and web 3.0 space to talk about the development of the internet, some wrong turns we took and how we might be able to fix it. And we are starting out with Bruce Pawn, someone who I personally met a couple of years ago when I was working on something very different. And he was already, um, as one of the pioneers in that space, exploring ways how to build something back then on Bitcoin even. And uh, he told me about the exciting technology that lets you align. And this is something that he mentions later in the interview, information and value. And this is actually how um, we came up with the name. So. I hope you like the format and now let's see what Bruce has to say. Uh, Bruce, you have been in the space since 2014, 15. Um, what has changed since then in the space? Uh, blockchain has gotten adoption in enterprise. We have probably 50 million people who are holding crypto and uh, people understand that it's a general purpose technology that will be integrated into the, the web of technology, machinery, industry, government. Uh, and so uh, instead of people asking at the very start of a meeting, what is blockchain now? They, they have a kind of an acceptance that blockchain will be uh, a part of their lives moving forward. Mm. Um, I'm mostly thinking about um, Uniswap, for example, um, what other pieces of technology come to mind that you think have matured to a point that they are um, actually being used right now? I think that just the, the, the core infrastructure of Ethereum, of Bitcoin, uh, and many of these uh, smart contract layers is, is production ready. It, it works. The um, amount of gas uh, being used, the transaction fees, all that point to uh, this system being vital to um, as plumbing for for a new future so uniswap is one of them but like uh, if, if you look at a higher picture what we've done is if um, the internet internet made it so that anybody could be a publisher for very little cost now anybody is going to be able to be a market maker for very little cost uh, you're going to have people who are able to be full-time traders on crypto on intellectual property on non-fungible tokens and artwork these are things where the jobs are now being created uh, and there's a fundamental shift from a kind of a machine and industry economy into an information economy where judgment is, um, is going to be very valuable. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that uh, jobs and technologies are being made where, where human judgment is a kind of a fundamental piece of that to make it work. Mm -hmm. You also recently launched um the ocean um, data marketplace um, so the core functionality of the ocean protocol can you tell us a little bit more about ocean and um, what feature set is now available and how you're planning on moving forward with ocean market it, it's essentially a user interface uh, that exposes the ocean smart contracts and for ocean the, there were two problems that we need to solve number one is people were scared to share information their data because they didn't have the privacy they didn't have a sense of comfort or security that the data would be respected. Uh, the second problem is, what is the value of the data? What's the price of the data? And these are the two main problems that Ocean solves. Uh, with Ocean V1 and V2, we brought together this core access control 
functionality that uses blockchain to lock and unlock access to data based on the conditions that uh, a data owner feels comfortable with and, and they themselves can define. Uh, V2 was this compute to data where the algorithms could come to the data and leave the data exactly where they were without moving, uh, do the computation and leave. And with Ocean V3, we have this concept of what's the value and price of data. And here we use the technologies that have matured in the last three or four years, which is things like um, liquidity pools, balancer, these types of things, as well as data tokens, which uh, represent the value of the data set. And these two pieces together allow Ocean V3 to function. So we have a thriving community of uh, 30,000 people who've used it. And uh, what happens is you can have your data set dynamically priced. The community actually prices it for you. So if you have some data that is, um, you don't know what the value is, you put it into the ocean market and the community pretty quickly helps you decide what the value of that data is. Mm -hmm. And then people can actually buy at that price. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned community and I mean, um, for, for a real data, um, open data exchange to, to really function, um, you need the community to, to integrate the ocean protocol. Um, can you share a little bit on, um, how difficult it is to, to build the community around it, uh, especially when we're looking at, um, an industry that might already be there that needs to change the way that it functions? Or would you rather say that um, an open source protocol needs to adapt to the way that the industry works to be able to see adoption? I think with Ocean Protocol, it is a native Web3 technology, which means that it is a use case where you don't have a lot of scoimorphism. Morphism. And, and what I mean by that is, when you, uh, the very first internet commerce platforms was pretty much, here's my store, here's the products, and it's just now on the internet, and that's called e-commerce. Mm. That was a scoimorphic kind of approach because it was a mental model that people understood. Here's my storefront yeah. in physical, here's my storefront. You just take it right. from them. You just yeah. lift and shift. Yeah. I think with the data economy, in the way that we've done data tokens and this concept of pricing dynamically, it's a native use case for data that wasn't there before. Mm. People uh, in the internet, they might have sold streaming music, subscriptions, you could download it, but all that stuff could yeah. be stolen very easily the moment somebody got control of it. And in, in our world, with access control, with dynamic pricing, you actually have a real-time price on data. And so I think that building a global community is the priority and allowing that to thrive allows the current industry to move to us. Yeah. Um, the current industry, it's, it's very opa opaque, it's intransparent. Nobody really understands the data industry. That's why we call it kind of a shadow data economy. And what we want is an open new data economy that kind of is more inclusive for everybody because people know what value of data is. They, they know it, um, just, they have a sense of what the value of data is, but there's very few people who actually know the price and the yeah. value of the data. And that, that information isn't public. Yeah. As a user, there is not an equivalent of the storefront that I could take to this new world, right? Like, because my data isn't really valued um, as of right now, it's rather being siloed. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? Because like, if you're, if you want to unsilo um, this, this data, you're going to be met with some resistance there. Have you already seen that resistance? Is there um, a reluctance of the of the incumbents to change or do you just say well look we're just going to build something completely different and so you're not in touch with these people that are siloing the data right now we're definitely in contact with those who are siloing the data and they're interested in this type of model i think that the best way to align incentives is to give them a price signal on what that value could, of the data could be worth if they unlocked it, if they unsiloed it. Mm -hmm. This goes for anybody. This isn't just enterprises, although that is what people typically think if they think about something like the internet platform. So you're actually saying the equilibrium could be better even for them because the value of even their own data is worth a lot more than they, are, than they think it is right now. I think, I think um, as a whole, more an order of magnitude or more of value can be unlocked. Mm. Whether that means their business models need to change, they get a smaller piece of the pie, or the pie grows bigger so they can even get a bigger piece. 
uh, that remains to be seen. But yeah. I'm optimistic that they could make way more money uh, and it's in their interest to unsilo the data while also having maybe a 100x growth of this data economy for everybody so that it is more inclusive. Okay. Um, I want to switch a little bit. Um, we are talking now about, about data, much um, of the infrastructure that we see is thriving right now in the space is around financial products and data. Why do you think this is? What needs to change for also other things to, to pick up adoption? And what would you say are the main areas where you would say that you are excited about, where you see adoption coming, coming our way? I think the financial use case was a part of the core vision of what Vitalik Buterin had for Ethereum. It was meant to uh, decompose and deconstruct the financial system we had. And the fact that we now see that that same infrastructure can be used for other native digital goods like data, intellectual property, uh, non-fungible tokens, art, virtual worlds, uh, as well as other things into the industrial sector. Uh, like supply chain information, energy information, all that sort of stuff. That's a good thing. And I think that the uh, that type of adoption is bound to happen. And how you make that adoption happen where it has not typically happened is to align the incentives. Uh, people really want to have one of two things. They either want to have this sense of adding value and it doesn't have to be monetary, but being a part of something that's new or it's, it's plain, they do want financial value. And so if you can find those incentives and build those in to the new model, then the adoption is gonna happen. If I could just go quickly back, the internet was built without an ownership layer. It was built just purely as information sharing layer, but you didn't have the value transport to go with the information mm. sharing. Blockchain is nothing more than the information layer plus the value transport mm. layer. And so that paradigm allows us to move away from the information to advertise, which is the current model we have on the internet, to information and value embedded into every piece of digital good that we have. And so that is the core, is to have a certain amount of token engineering, a certain amount of value engineering, and the incentive alignment, uh, while ga having game theoretic models to um, stop scammers and frauds and people who are trying to cheat and stuff like that. So all that together, Uh, allows for adoption in the system because if the incentives are aligned, of course you're going to want to do this. Where do you see those incentives being most misaligned due to the Web2 um, characteristics of information and, and value separation? So uh, Albert Wenger, he's a partner at Union, Union Square Ventures. He's uh, one of the best VCs in the world. He, he talks about this paradigm of an industrial age economy versus an information age economy. And everything that we have from the government to the, the industrial sector, uh, to the, kind of the framework of how we as a society operate, operate is based on this machine industrial age philosophy. And in an information age uh, economy, it's based on attention. It's based on a certain passion. It's, it's inclusive and stuff. And so that is kind of the direction that we need to go to to allow um, this to flower. We need that type of, inf uh, that type of paradigm to happen. Um, and that's what I think is the limiting factor because people, most people don't understand that yet. That, that's not common knowledge. And um, that type of wisdom is something that uh, proceeds with the technology. Can I still try to pin you down on some trends that you see where you where you think like some some industries or use cases that you find super interesting right now where you think adoption is, is coming um, coming up? I think that there are probably 10,000 different projects going on um, across the broad front yeah. of areas and and when I say that blockchain is a general purpose technology. It's like electricity. It infuses itself into everything. It's like transport networks where they start weaving their web across our physical environment. Mm -hmm. It's like AI, which is now in almost every single product and software that we use. There is not one thing that you could say blockchain is going to move further and faster on necessarily, although there are some that you know people notice. 
blockchain is is infusing itself across the board because you're you're welding this concept of information transport with value transport together um and so in the very short term it feels like we're not moving that fast but in the yeah. long term we're going to go very far so to say it in different words you think it's kind of irrelevant because it's such a massive change that it will affect um uh Yeah, I mean, if you look at AI right now, do you, do you know that almost every single object has AI built into it, whether it's your smart fridge, your phone, your car, um, everything, uh, video, uh, the editing, it all has AI. The, the Moore's law has been driven by AI. Uh, all of these things, uh, AI has infused itself. And the fact that we're not conscious of it, that's not a bad thing. But that's also a sign that it's a general purpose technology. And I think blockchain is that type of thing. Okay. Um, let's take a quick look at the uh, technical developments in the space. Uh, can you share what you're most excited about um, in terms of um, pushes that infrastructure layer um, type of things that are coming up? We've been talking a lot about uh, scaling. Mm -hmm. uh, in the space, whether it's for Ethereum, Bitcoin, or some of these other solutions that are now coming up. I think that's important. And I think scaling comes with use case adoption, the need. We, we only need, to, there's no need to waste energy on scaling until you actually need it. And now we're actually at that point where that scaling uh, is useful. But I think uh, as with any technology, the hardest part of the technology has, is almost now behind us, I would say the the part that we want to keep an eye on is how do we get to the next seven billion people we're at 50 million people how do we get to the next seven billion people and so the internet when it was at 50 million people that was probably in 1993 94 95 somewhere around there around the netscape browser days and so then the question is if you look at that parallel of the internet till now what did it take to get the internet from 70 million people or 50 million people all the way up to 7 billion people and it was things mm -hmm. like new devices mobile phones it was watches mm -hmm. it was laptop computers and uh, a different paradigm and a design language that everybody now understands so that that apple kind of uh, perfected and such like that everything every time you walk into a website and you start clicking on buttons and it's just intuitive this is also a design language we need to build this type of thing into blockchain That includes that value layer as well as keeping control of your keys. So that's the most kind of soft and fuzzy thing that will bring the most value. So you're almost shifting from basic infrastructure towards user experience and interfaces now. And applications. Oh, okay. Right? We're, we're going, you know, there's an, there's a, uh, an estimate that the uh, data value in the automotive sector is about 500 billion. If you look at something like an Apple and Amazon and Google, that's their revenue. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, if you say that the value of the data in the automotive sector is 500 billion, you're talking about in the next 10 years, if that can get unlocked, another Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google just for automotive data. And if you do this across multiple sectors, you're talking 20 or 30 large companies that are built off data with a value aspect to it and not advertising, which is currently the case mm. okay just one last question to to wrap up our conversation and uh, i mean i know you've been working with vitalik at some point so maybe that's an unfair question but uh, if you were to 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 interview someone in the space uh, someone that you that you like that um, whose work you admire uh, who would that be and what would you ask that person why would you interview this person Of course, we all look want to lionize somebody like a Vitalik or Satoshi and such like that. But I think that the history that will be written about blockchain will be very multifaceted. Can you still pick someone that you're just currently excited about, just even if it's a, a small project or a not so famous uh, founder? I, I, I really admire the ability of certain founders to be... Uh, very lucid and explain concepts so one that sticks out is someone like sergey nazarov from link he is able to explain concepts both at a macro and micro level and also at a humanistic level that people can understand thank you for tuning into our very first episode of information and value 
I hope you, that you liked the interview with Bruce um, and that you got some new ideas um, from this interview. I certainly did. Uh, we would like to ask you for your feedback on our format that we created here. Um, maybe in the comments below or you can write me an email. Um, in the next episodes, we will have some amazing guests that I know already and we would like to see you here again.